Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Adam Smith. I'm the director of the Robert Mayer Institute, American Institute, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all here for this year's inaugural lecture by the 2023 to 24 John G. Weiner Professor of American Government, Professor Jason Casellas. And we're both dressed up in costume because this is an inaugural lecture for a statutory professorship in the university. And before I introduce uh, Jason, I want to acknowledge the uh, extraordinary generosity of the late Rivington Wynant and Joan Wynant, who have endowed this professorship in honour of John Gilbert Wynant, who was appointed ambassador to the court of St. James by Franklin Roosevelt in the midst of the Blitz. According to the author of a book about Americans in wartime London, Ambassador Wynant's warmth and compassion and his determination to stand with them and share their dangers was the first tangible sign for the British that America and its people really cared about what happened to them. He became a symbol of the best side of America. At the REI, we're very proud to host a professorship named for Ambassador Wynant and proud, too, of the distinguished roster of political scientists who held the chair since its creation. Um, Mrs. Wynant, Joan Wynant, couldn't uh, be here this evening, um, but as it happens, I will be seeing her in New York on Thursday, and I promised her a full account of this evening's lecture, and she sends her very best wishes uh, to Jason. <coughs> so this year's lecturer, uh, Jason Casellas, is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Houston. Jason is one of the U.S.'s foremost scholars of Latino politics, a subject on which uh, there has been, uh, which is increasingly central, of course, to our understanding of American politics. His research has been published uh, in many prestigious outlets. His book, Latino Representation in the State House, uh, in State Houses and Congress in 2011, was a field-changing work, explaining how and when Latino candidates win and whether they need Latino majority districts to be successful, and provides critical insights on how Latino state legislators view their role as representatives and their relationship to Latino constituents. So it's my very great pleasure to invite Professor Casales to deliver the 2024 John G. Weiner Lecture in American Government entitled Shifting Allegiances, the Election of Latino Republicans to Congress and State Legislatures. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Smith, for that really kind introduction. Um, it's really been a great pleasure being here this year and uh, here at the REI with a great staff as well. And I've really uh, come to uh, have a great experience here with, uh, with everyone, including all the graduate students uh, here at the REI and other fellows. Of course, I've also been really um, blessed to be at Balliol College, and there's some, some of you from Balliol where I've met some really fascinating people there, and I'm really grateful um, to be here as this year's Wine Professor. Uh, my lecture today will focus on this new work uh, that, I've been, that I've been working on with a graduate student uh, back at the University of Houston, and it builds really on my first book that um, Professor Smith alluded to. Uh, that you know, my first book was sort of the first book really ever written on Latino representation in Congress and in state legislatures back in 2011. Um, and since that time, a lot has happened and a lot has changed. And so I got into this project um, mainly because a lot has changed in the, in the aspect of partisanship. And what I want to do today is talk a little bit about this forthcoming book. It's going to be coming out with Cambridge on Element Series. Um, and that will be hopefully later this year uh, before the election. That's my timeline. Uh -huh. um, and so in the aftermath of the 2020 election, right, pundits and journalists were perplexed at the number of Latinos who voted to reelect Donald Trump, right, especially in places like South Florida and South Texas. While still the vast majority of Latinos did indeed vote for President Biden, the puzzle remains about the 27 to 30 percent or so of Latinos nationwide who have consistently supported Republicans in presidential elections. Many thought that Trump's rhetoric about Mexican immigrants in particular, as well as his strict policies on immigration, would lead to a record low voter turnout, uh, sorry, a record low vote for uh, the 
Republicans and affect down-ballot candidates. This did not materialize, and in fact, since 2018, we've seen a growth of Latino Republicans running for and winning at both the state and federal levels at places that one wouldn't expect. And so the book that I'm writing will try to explain why. You know, who are these Latino Republicans serving in Congress and in state legislatures? How are they similar or different than their Democratic Latino counterparts? And so in this book, I'm going to try to answer these questions. And in this talk, I'll give you a brief uh, overview of what we're planning on doing. And I use the term shifting allegiances to show that despite predictions that Latinos would abandon Republicans with the rise of Trump in 2016 due to his rhetoric about immigration, there's actually been an increase in Latinos voting for Republicans since 2018. And correspondingly, Latino Republican candidates running for Congress and state legislative seats, and subsequently winning such races. Um, before I do that, I want to just give you an overview. I know this is an international audience, so I wanted to give you a sense of the Latino population in the United States and you know where, where they're situated. As you can see, right, the southwest of the United States, the states of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California, are where the, the largest concentration of people who are Hispanic or Latino are located. And let me just uh, stop here and say there's a lot of different terminology used for this population, and I won't get into that debate at the moment. Um, I just use Latino in this talk, and that sort of refers to people of Latin American origin in the United States, so people from Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean. Um, there are other terms that are used, but um, this is a term that's been used for quite some time. So I'm using that now, but I understand there's a sort of a debate about which terms to use, but I would rather sort of table that at the moment and just uh, focus on this. Well, what you can see is that those states, California down through Texas, well, it's not surprising that that's where the bulk of the Hispanic or Latino population is, because that was uh, a last part of Mexico up until 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. But what we're seeing is the Northeast, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, you see sort of uh, the shade getting a little bit darker there. I mean, there's sort of more uh, Latinos moving into those areas. Um, but in terms of percentages, right, the top five states, uh, of course, Puerto Rico is not a state, but it's, it's included there, which is obviously uh, mostly uh, Puerto Ricans living in Puerto Rico. But New Mexico, of course, is the state with the largest percentage of Latinos. 48% or so. Then, of course, California, Texas, and Arizona. In terms of sheer population, California and Texas are on top, right? So you have 15 million and 12 million or so in Texas. Um, and so um, what we're seeing, though, again, and I'll show you the data in a second, that most of the Latino candidates running for office have traditionally run in uh, South Florida, especially the Republicans, which I'll talk about in a second, but also increasingly in other parts of the country. Uh, including those states that you wouldn't expect a lot of Latinos, Republicans running, or Latinos in general, states like Montana, up there uh, as well. So Latinos then account for about 19.5% of the U.S. population. So if that just gives you a sense of the overall uh, population. I remember when I first started teaching, you know, um, 20, 20 years ago, it was about 12%. Um, and so if you look at the changes in population in the United States. The fastest growing demographic group, uh, it, fastest growing is actually Asian Americans, believe it or not, but the, not in terms of sheer numbers. In terms of sheer numbers, it's Latinos. Um, and so in states like Texas, California, it's a majority minority uh, state, meaning if you combine all the minorities, uh, it, it, it's sort of a, uh, places where um, you have large uh, minority populations. Uh, Latinos are politically diverse, right? Um, and, of course, diverse in many respects. Latinos come from different backgrounds, from different immigration backgrounds. In Texas, you have Tejanos who have lived in that state for generations and would never be considered an immigrant. You can even go back to third, fourth generations and there, there's no immigration there. Um, in 2020, we saw a growth in the Latinos, in Latinos voting Republican. The Republican National Committee opened Hispanic community centers in 19 states in 2022. There's also been a lot happening with independent groups going into Latino neighborhoods. There's one called the Libre Initiative that's trying to promote um, not directly Republican 
uh, voting, but indirectly uh, Republican voting. And there are a lot of sort of um, theories about how or why this happened, while these factors informing this movement towards Republicans, the role of religiosity or religion among some Latinos, um, this anti-socialism rhetoric, especially in the South Florida races with Venezuelan uh, exiles, and of course the whole Trump factor. Um, but if you just look at this chart here, in terms of the number of Hispanics or Latinos elected to office since 2001, there's been a, a, a very, very significant increase, almost double. Now that includes every office. That includes Congress, state legislature, and um, school board, you name it. So why are all these questions important, right? They're important as we see. Latinos currently constitute about one out of five Americans, and this percentage is likely to grow regardless of changes in American immigration policy. But we're beginning to learn more about public opinion attitudes and the vote choice of Latinos who vote for Republicans. We don't know enough about the extent to which these attitudes and opinions are translated into Latino Republican candidates running for office and also where they're winning. Right? And so that's sort of the the gist of what I'm working on here on this book. Uh, the second reason questions about this are important is that they reflect underlying questions about partisanship, broadly conceived. Some people assume that the story of Latino Republicans parallels the story of black Republicans. According to this view, Latino and black Republicans are analogous in terms of their attitudes and beliefs. There may be some similarities, but there are also some significant differences as well. Um, just to give you a sense, I've been talking a little bit about that, but I want to show you historically, you know, how Latinos have voted for president and the House of Representatives since, you know, this goes back to 2012. And in 2012, that would be the vote for uh, in the Obama versus Romney race. And, um, and that's when Obama received 71% of the uh, Latino votes, so a really significant uh, win there. And you can see it's been sort of going up and down, but by 2022 in the congressional races, it narrowed to 60% for Democrats and 39% for Republicans, right? So there's been this narrowing that's, that's undeniably happening. And, um, and this is sort of overall, and, and the sense is that since 2012, you can see from 71 to 60, that's a significant drop. And for Republicans from 27 up to 39, there's something significant, so there's something happening here. What it is isn't very clear, but we're going to try to explain it. All right. Um, another thing that I think is important happening, and I just wanted to show you some of this because it, the project is not about public opinion and not about sort of this, this, those changes, but there's a lot happening that I think is important. This is from the Financial Times a few weeks ago. And what we're seeing is non-white, non-college voters continue to trend in, in some respects away from Democrats. And again... You know, I don't want to over uh, em overemphasize here that many Republicans think that this is this sort of massive shift to Republicans, and I'm not saying that, as you can see here, it's not a massive shift, but it's it's significant, and we're trying to explain why. But non-white, non-college voters, you can see since 2018, right? Sorry, since 2008, that there has been this shift away from Democrats and towards Republicans, and for the purpose of this talk, with Hispanics or, or Latinos. Um, the shift, of course, is, has been in, in some ways more significant. With blacks, of course, um, there's been a shift, but the difference is that blacks are so overwhelmingly Democrat that the shift is not as significant. Um, with Asian Americans, the shift is not as large, but it's, it's happening as well. And so there's something about, um, and this is a, a topic probably for the presidential election and other cases about appealing to the white working class, but also the working class in general, and how, um, how that's changing. Um, from the 2022 election, this is a, a graph that, um, it's not mine, but it's from AEI, but I think the point here is that if you look in the 2022 congressional election, um, and you look at sort of the expectation of how Republicans, um, uh, sort of, uh, Republicans would benefit from the Latino vote. What you see in those little in those little circles, the red circles, are those places in which there are districts with more than 25% of Latinos in them. And what you can see is Republicans overperform expectations in those districts. And that's why you see all of those red dots um, on these sort of um, 
upper right hand quadrant. Um, and so what's that, what, what that indicates, or what seems to indicate, is that Republicans are overperforming right, among, uh, among Latinos. And this is happening in districts that are uh, more significantly Latino or Hispanic. And so if we think about how this translates into Congress, right, this graph just shows you a little bit about the racial and ethnic diversity and how it continues to grow in Congress. And this takes us back um, several years now. But what you can see here is, it, is the Hispanic uh, numbers of Hispanics in Congress has steadily increased to the point where they're um, about 54 now. Um, and it was like 23 back 20 years ago or so. So there has been this, this gradual shift. And it's been happening really with, with all the different groups, with African Americans and also Latinos. Um, African Americans have generally tended to do a little bit better in terms of election to Congress because you don't have a large non-citizen population of African Americans, whereas with Latinos you do. There are a lot of non-citizens who can't vote, and so that's why you can't just look at population and sort of juxtapose that to um, to seat share. <clears throat> um, this also gives you a sense of the breakdown by party, and this is the current Congress. And what you can see is that among Republicans, right, all the purple dots are white. White people, right? And so generally Republicans are very white, very purple, right? But you know, so are Democrats, but you do have more um, diversity within the Democratic ranks in the House. Um, but what you do know on the Republican side in the House is that, you know, there's a not insignificant number of red dots, meaning Latino Republicans serving in Congress and, uh, and two in the Senate, um, but in the House of Representatives. Okay, so um, as we talk a little bit about um, who these Latino Republicans are, you know, scholars of Latino politics have long made the case that Latinos are not monolithic. There's considerable diversity within this group. And as I said, the majority of Latinos do identify as Democrats. As you've seen, most Latino elected officials are Democrats. Um, but um, what we see as well here is that the Latino electorate is starting to change, right? And the role of Latino candidates is also starting to starting to change as well. And so one of, the, one of the things that we've seen in the past is that the traditionally the Latino Republicans running have been predominantly Cuban-American, right? These are people who fled the Cuban um, uh, revolution in 1959, mostly in the 1960s. And um, because of their anti-communism, those were sort of the Latino Republicans. And so if you go back to the 70s, 80s, 90s, those were the, pretty much the only people running and winning, right, were the Cubans in South Florida. Um, there's also a large Cuban uh, population in New Jersey, but they're ge generally very democratic. So it was really kind of a Florida phenomenon, right? And so there's not much to say about Latino Republican elected officials other than to say they're mostly men from South Florida who are Cuban American, right? Um, so they're, like I said before, predominantly male, and limited to Florida, but then there was also this sort of in New Mexico, there's always been this tradition of electing Republicans, although that's kind of withering out. Um, and then also in Texas, there's, a, there's been sort of a significant um, small chunk of the Texas Latino population that's been a Republican. You know, but has this changed? And that's what I want to explore a little bit today. And um, given that we're talking about Latino Republicans, I figured I'd put faces uh, to, to these names. And this, this uh, woman here, Michelle Pena from Arizona, it's an interesting story because this is a Mexican-American woman elected in 2022 from Arizona. She was a Yuma, Arizona school teacher in a very Hispanic district that had never really elected a Republican. And she decided to run in 2022 um, with $1,600 in her uh, in her bank account, and ultimately won the election, um, beating her opponent by a couple thousand votes. Right, kind of on a platform of going door to door, and she got some support as her campaign proceeded. But I think the important thing to remember about this is that we're seeing, and this is going to be a highlight of what I'm going to try to make the case for today is that there are more and more Latina Republicans running. Um, and that's where we see most of the growth. And I'm going to show you the data to support this, this point. And I'll talk a little bit about my data set in a second. But in 2018, and why is this important? Let me get back to Arizona. Arizona is a swing state. 
Biden won Arizona by 10,000 votes right? in a state that's uh, 26, 27 percent Latino. A lot of, you know, every vote counts. And if you see some candidates for the state legislature, like this lady, running and winning, this is something that um, should be paid attention to. And even in Arizona, it's a state that has sort of a split legislature. So it's a 50-50 legislature. So every single, you know, legislator can make a difference. And one of the things that's interesting about her story as well is that she pushed for a bill that the Democratic governor vetoed. It was called the Tamale Bill. For those of you who know, tamale is sort of a, a Mexican food where it's on corn um, you know, with, with a stuffing. And well, what, what was this bill about? Um, there are a lot of street vendors, right, um, food trucks, right, and they would sell tamales. And um, she wanted to sort of uh, loosen some of the health and safety regulations uh, on, uh, on tamale vendors, right? And so she pushed for this bill. It didn't pass, but... This is the kind of thing, right, that would probably only resonate with a certain subset of maybe the business owners, uh, you know, in their district. But um, since 2018, then these candidates are better distributed across the United States, and not just Florida, right, um, for many different national origin groups, right, not just Cubans, <laughs> and increasingly women, increasingly female. So this is a, this is a very fascinating story that, that I'll show you that we've uncovered some data. A couple other folks that I want to mention. Because, again, this is happening not only at the state legislative level, but at the U.S. congressional level. So these are two women, Latinas, who, Myra Flores on the left and uh, Monica de la Cruz on the right. Although, politically, that wouldn't be the case. I think Myra would be more on the right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but Myra Flores was someone who ran the special election seat in Texas. Got a lot of attention because she was the first... Uh, she was actually born in Mexico and later, you know, went to Texas and ran a very, very conservative campaign and won a special election. She's running again for this uh, legislative seat in South Texas. Um, but it's just one example of a, a Mexican immigrant Republican running and winning in a, in a district that had never elected a Republican. This is South Texas, where the Democratic Party has been very, very strong. And likewise, Monica De La Cruz from Brownsville, sort of a business owner, she ran in the, her Brownsville district, again, first uh, Republican elected from this majority Hispanic or majority Latino district. And so um, I think these are emblematic of what we're seeing, right? These are not Cubans. These are not men. Right? These are Mexican-American women, right, running as Republicans and um, in both cases winning. Flores then subsequently lost in 2022. Um, but she's running again, so there's a primary uh, March 5th, right, Super Tuesday, and uh, she's running again for that same seat. So we're all watching to see whether she'll win that primary. But this is happening from the California Senate to the Mississippi House, right? Um, Senator Rosalicio Chimabo, first Latina Republican elected in California. Again, a state that's not generally hospitable to uh, Republicans in general, but especially Latino Republicans. Um, but then you also have uh, striking things happening in other parts of the country, like this case, um, Shane Aguirre from, from Mississippi, of all places, from Tupelo, Mississippi, um, who kind of runs on this um, sort of conservative right platform for Lee County. It's, it's a county, you know, in Tupelo, Mississippi. Um, and this is a case that's interesting because if you look at his sort of campaign materials and he doesn't sort of talk a lot about his Latino heritage or anything like that. And, you know, after some Google sleuthing, I figured out his, great, his grandparents were from Mexico. But it took a while, right, to figure this out. But even then, in places like Mississippi, there is still a sense in which, you know, perhaps members of the community may not totally welcome, right, someone with his profile. In fact, I found an um, interesting story, which I'll share. It was a text message there um, that was uh, a journalist found. The Lee County Sheriff, Jim Johnson, texted this to another white elected official about the involvement of this state representative in a, in a bill in the state legislature about where to locate the county jail. And this county, again, 3% Latino, very, very minimally Latino county. Um, and I found, you know, the Daily Mail here has some really, really interesting headlines. But this is their headline. <laughs> <laughs> the white Mississippi Sheriff, <coughs> a white lawmaker, saying that Hispanic politician is, quote, worse than the black. Right, so, um, so again, it's not the case that, even though these are Republicans, that they're totally welcomed 
they, they would, <laughs> with open arms in some of these communities. And despite that, right, they are able to, to run and win in such places, even if you don't emphasize their, their Hispanic uh, identity. All right, so let me talk a little bit about the, the book and what I plan on doing in the book in a chapter outline. And I'll try to give you some um, preliminary findings. Right? So in the first substantive chapter, I'm going to address the transformation of Latino Republican representation by looking at the election of Republican candidates to state legislatures in Congress. And again, as I said before, the literature suggests that most of these Republican Candidates are of Cuban background, disproportionately male, and limited to Florida and Texas, right? Um, I'll talk about the data set I'm using, but it only goes back to 2018 in terms of candidates. One of the problems is that collecting data on candidates is very, very difficult. Um, because once candidates run for office, and if they lose, they'll usually just stop paying for their website. <laughs> right? So you can't find who these people are. It's always easy to get data on winners, right? Um, in fact, my first book was all about winners, and one of the criticisms, well, you didn't talk about the candidates. I said, well, I didn't have the data. <laughs> uh, and so that's the issue. But since 2018, we have the data because of this really great data set. Uh, this chapter uses descriptive data to illustrate how Latino Republican candidates have changed over these recent election cycles. They pay close attention to the geographic distribution of such candidates who see the most success. And I uncover these causal mechanisms that inform the increasing reach and diversity of Latino Republican candidates for state legislature. And in the third chapter, what I do is I look at ideology and electoral success, because that's kind of the next question, right? The next question is, do these Latino Republicans who are elected to office vote the same way as other Republicans or other Latinos, right? What's more salient in their sort of background? And one of the things we also do is examine how the gender and national origin group of Latino Republican candidates have informed their success across all districts. And our results then highlight this emerging trend of Republican success in districts with low Latino populations. So what we do is we take this existing data set and we add measures for legislator ideology and district ideology to judge the efficacy of ideology as a predictor for Latino Republican electoral success. An added benefit of using this legislator ideology is that it allows us to see how Latino Republicans differ ide ideologically from Republicans of other ethnicities. And what I'll show in a minute, um, but this is not a mystery novel, I'll tell you what the result is. <laughs> Latino Republican legislators are on average actually the most conservative group among Republican legislators. With Latinas, women, exhibiting particularly the high levels of conservatism when compared to other groups. And we find that Latino Republican legislators show higher levels of ideological extremity in districts that feature low proportions of Latino residents. And so I'm going to show you some of the evidence in a second. And then the last chapter, I look at the outliers, right? These Latino Republicans in majority white districts. Um, in particular, these um, these, these majority white, white districts, we look, at, we look at campaign materials. And in many cases, Republican candidates conceal or otherwise sort of hide their heritage and instead stress other things like religion or conservative values. And this poses a challenge for how we think about representation as it raises an important question. If a Republican candidate is found to be Latino despite attempting to conceal their ethnicity from their campaign completely, would it be disingenuous to describe that candidate as representative of Latinos? And it makes classifying the ethnicity of Latino Republican candidates quite difficult. And I'll show you this in a second because as we try to code some of these candidates' ethnicity, it's not always so easy because you have people who have Hispanic or Latino surnames who don't identify as Latino. But you also have people who have surnames that are Anglo surnames and they identify as Latino. Case in point, Bill Richardson, the late Bill Richardson, was the governor of New Mexico, and he was, of course, a Mexican mother and identified as Latino. So um, let's get into some of the data. Um, this is a cooperative candidate characteristic data set that goes back to 2018, and every two years we've been doing it. Um, what it is, is that it's a consortium of political scientists, and we all code the candidates' ethnicities and races as well, and gender, from all the different states, and then we share that data. 
because we all have different purposes of using this data. And uh, we, in, in my project, we further coding of the data set, adding U.S. congressional candidates, right? because this is just state legislatures. Um, and what I do is I focus on the changes in the Latino Republican candidate pool from 2018 to 22, um, and the ethnic distribution as well, and whether these changes are affecting election outcomes. Another thing that this data set doesn't do is that it doesn't code the national origin of all these different candidates. And so uh, my really great uh, graduate student has done, gone in and done all that. So we can get a better sense of who, you know, uh, because we can't say Latino is, you know, who are these Latinos? Are they Mexican or Cuban? Or, so we have the data on that, which I'll show you. Okay. Um, so how do Latino candidates sort of, if we just look at all Republican candidates for state legislature, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, how many are Latino? Right? What's the, what are the numbers we're dealing with? So in 2018 and 2020, if you see the percentage of Republican candidates are mostly white, I mean, and that makes sense, right? <laughs> So we're talking about the vast majority being white, but I'm kind of zeroing in on this. 2018, you have 135 Latinos, and then 2020, you have 222. So it's a, it's a pretty significant increase. Right? Um, you did see a decrease in black uh, Republican candidates. Um, Asian, you saw kind of a, a slight, very slight uh, increase. But the increase, other and there's a decrease with whites, right? So the only increase is, is with Latinos. <laughs> But again, it's still, it's still fairly a small subset. Um, if you look at the party breakdown of Latino candidates for Congress and then also for state legislatures, I think one of the things that you'll know, it, you'll notice is that when we look at the congressional candidates, still the vast majority are Democrats, right? So in 2018, it was about 70%, but then it went down to 60%. And Republicans, it's about a third in 2018, and then up to 40%. At the state legislative level, which is the bottom part, um, what you see is that um, it's a, a similar, right? 75% are Democrats in 2018, 66% in 2020, and then about a third are Republican in 2020. So this is just the candidates. Uh, running. Um, in terms of the geographic changes from 2018 to 2020, um, this chart just shows you the, the Latino Republican candidates for Congress by state, so where are they running? And, you know, you see in 2020 the largest number are in places like Texas, right, um, like California, and like Florida. Um, and then you still have one or two people running for, um, you know, in, in all these other states. So I have a lot of data, so I apologies in advance. That's what political scientists do. We need the data. For state legislatures... Again, more it's a bigger graph because between 2018 and 2020, you can look at all the other states, and you see Latino Republican candidates are running pretty much everywhere, right? Not just Texas, California, Florida. Yes, they're small numbers, right? <laughs> this is true, but they're starting to run. I'm very sorry. Is this candidates for nominated or just people seeking the nomination? These people seeking the nomination and primaries, right? So this would be in the Republican primary. Yeah. And again, this is not including. We're not judging right now sort of the quality of the candidate or whether the candidate's a serious candidate. That'll come later, and I'll, I'll show you that. Um, by gender, so to get a sense of uh, men versus women, right, at, on the top there, this is for Congress. And what you can see is that since 2018, you, you know, you've gone, you go from 3 to 10, right, which for Congress, that's a significant increase, whereas for, for, for males, it's about the same. So you do see, again, more Latinas running especially more Latino Republicans at the congressional level, which you see up there. And then even at the bottom, at the state legislative level, it's also pretty significant. You go from 31 to 82, and whereas for male candidates, it's 103 to 140. So again, there's something happening where we're seeing a lot, a significant number of Latino Republicans running, right? Um, and we want to try to think about why that's happening. Uh, the gender breakdown in terms of by state, right? There doesn't seem to be huge patterns, but you do see in Texas, right? A lot of the women, I showed you two of them just a few minutes ago, right? So maybe that's explaining a big gap there, but um, generally you do see it in fewer states, but there we see um, women running in New Mexico, Georgia, only women running in those two states. At the state legislative level, the gender breakdown, again, all these different states, but you have women running pretty much everywhere, um, just with a few exceptions. Um, 
This is going haywire. <laughs> <laughs> I think I stopped here. Okay, national origin, yeah, because you may be thinking to yourself, are these Latinos, or these, these must be all Cubans, right? Well, no, if you look at actually the um, diversity of Latino Republicans in the state legislative races, Mexican origin are the largest at 74, right? So what we're seeing then is um, more Mexican origin people running as Republicans. And this is a big change. We wouldn't have found that 20 years ago, or even probably 10 years ago, because it was generally more of a Cuban Remember, Mexican Americans are about 60% of the Latino population in the U.S. So most of the Latinos in the U.S. are Mexican origin. Right? But another interesting thing, I mean, Cubans would be next, and that's, that makes sense. But then the third are Puerto Ricans at 33. And this is fascinating to me. Because Puerto Ricans, of course, are U.S. citizens, right? And so they can go to and from the United States without any issues of immigration. Um, and there's a large... Puerto Rican community in Central Florida, in Orlando. Um, and the bulk of these Puerto Ricans are running as Republicans there, right? Not New York, which is where you have the, really the largest Puerto Rican population. And it's interesting because Puerto Ricans are the most, of all the Latino groups, historically the most democratic. But here you see some movement here. And, um, and the reason for that, I think, is there's a large evangelical Christian movement in Puerto Rico, and many of these, I think, are evangelicals. I haven't gone through and looked at all 33 yet, but I, I think I'll figure it out at some point. Um, here, if you just look at it by state, um, again, you know, Florida is where you see all the Cubans running, but we see Cubans pretty much running in a lot of other places as well, not just Florida. But um, I think the, the interesting thing here is that on the very top is Latino subgroup unknown. What does that mean? <laughs> Well, this is the problem I told you about earlier, right? Um, when looking at sort of coding these candidates and, and whether they're Latino or not and looking at their national origin, it's impossible in some cases to determine this, right? And, you know, you could try to pick up a phone and call some number, but who knows what, what that'll run, you know, run, run there. Um, and so it's, it's not insignificant. It's a top blue line. And so you can see in some places, like New Mexico, it's pretty high. Latino subgroup is unknown. Um, and so that could pose some problems, and we can talk maybe in Q&A about how to deal with this, but, but that's, uh, all, you know, that's something that we're, we're thinking about. So based on this, what are some of the hypotheses or things that, that we can expect? You know, despite the growth of non-Cuban Latino Republicans running that, we think that still Cuban Republicans are more likely to win, all things equal, right? Because they're going to be running in places where they're sort of a large, longer political incorporation. They may have more establishment uh, credentials, more money. Um, and so once you're politically incorporated, you're going to be more likely to, to win. Um, and Latino Republicans also think are less likely to identify as Latino their campaign materials outside of places where it would be beneficial, like Florida and South Texas. And we think that Latino Republicans also be more likely to win when they run than, than the male, than their male kind. And this is based on a lot of previous research in general that does show that Latinas uh, are much better at winning, at attracting um, voter, at white voters than, than men, right? There's something about Latinas um, having an ability to win at easier, higher rates. There's a, there's a book that was written on this on topic. Okay, and so if we look at, um, so I've been looking at all the candidates and so look at election outcomes. Well, yeah, the majority of people who are running are going to lose, right? <laughs> so it's seventy three percent lose, twenty seven percent win. Okay, um, if you look at female and male, um, what's interesting here, right, is that um, twenty nine percent of females lose, um, forty five percent of, uh, of males lose, and about nine percent of females win, and eighteen percent men win. Okay, so that's just the aggregate, right? That's the overall data that we find. Um, and if we look across states, then what you find is in terms of who lost and who won, right? Again, most, most are losing. But you can see here, Florida, is that where you see the most, most of them winning, right? Which kind of supports what I was saying earlier um, in the sense that, yes, you have a lot more candidates running, but you have a lot more winning. And so it could just be a, a question of the 
proportion. But even in some smaller states like Wyoming, right, um, you know, you only have a few runnings with one win, so the percentage will be high, but it's still only one. <laughs> So Latino Republican candidates are winning at higher rates in states with low Latino populations. So why, right? Well, there's some things that we what we think are happening here. It could be the role of religion. Many rural states with Latino Republican winners have these large evangelical populations. In an analysis of these campaign literatures, we do find a lot of emphasis on this. Um, but many candidates do not feature their ethnicity or race or anything on any campaign material at all. Right? And so generally there what we see is that candidates are running really as, um, as just gener generic Republicans or conservatives or you know, family values, you know, the kind of typical things you would expect. Right? And so if we put this in graphical form, generally what we have here, you have the Hispanic population on the x-axis <coughs> at the bottom, right, from 0 to 100. And then electoral success is from zero to one, so do you win or lose, right? So the blue is the Democrats and, and uh, red is Republicans. Um, the, uh, I guess the shaded area in red and shaded blue would just be the, the, I guess what we call the confidence intervals, right? So I think the point here, uh, the, the takeaway is you have this opening up so that, as I said before, right, these districts that are really low in Hispanic population they do have a, a better shot of electing Republicans, right? Which, which makes sense, which is what I said earlier, that many of these Latino Republicans are running you know, as just Republicans, right? But it's still not that high. It's not over 50% or anything like that. Um, but then you start to see the split there, whereas once you get to the districts that are very strongly Hispanic, very strongly Latino, then the probability of electing Republican is you're, you're there between 10 and 10 so it's very low, right? It's not impossible, but it's, but it's very low. Whereas districts with really large Hispanic populations, much more likely to elect Democrats. So this graph shouldn't be a surprise, and it's just based on a, on a statistical model from the plot of the determinants of total success, right? And this is what you're going to get, because it's still the case, right, that most, most Latino populations are Democrats. Um, in terms of national origin and election outcomes, here you see, interestingly, that, it's, that Cubans still do quite well, but they're, again, Mexican um, origin Latino Republicans are winning, right? Um, at, you know, almost will be even higher rate than, than Cubans even. Right? Um, so it's not by much, but it's something that's, that's happening, right? And then you see a splattering of other uh, national origin groups as well winning. Okay. So um, this takes me to the next part of the presentation where I talk a little bit about, you know, once these Latino Republicans are in the legislature or in Congress, right, um, then how do they vote? Do they vote differently or are they, you know, are they more conservative or less conservative and how do we know that? And so one of the things that, that we think is that Latino Republicans will be more conservative on average than the non-Latino Republican legislators. And in the book, I'm going to spell this out more as to why this is the case, but briefly, the reason for this is that Latino Republicans have to do more to convince Republicans in general that they are genuinely conservative, right? Because there is a presupposition that they may not be, right? So they have to prove that they're bona fides, right? And so I think that's what's happening here. Latino Republican legislators will be more likely to be ideologically conservative, we think, than Latino counterparts. And again, this is even more the case with Latinas, with women, right? Because you have a gender gap, right? That in general, women are more progressive, more liberal in general, and that's true with Latinas too. So they have to do even more to show that they're very, very conservative. And then as a proportion of Latinos in a district decreases, we think the conservative ideological extremity of the Latino Republican legislator will increase. And so, um, this, this graph just shows you the ideological extremity from zero to four. What this is, it's uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Borshore, has uh, data on all the state legislat legislators and looks at all their roll call votes, right, and puts them into a, uh, into a computer uh, spreadsheet, right, and does what's called a Monte Carlo simulation, right, and basically comes up with um, 
this is done in Congress too. It's called nominate scores, where it basically gives you from left to right um, uh, an ideological score, right, on every member of Congress or every state legislator. Right? And so this is what we do here, and we use those scores. And so what we find is that, right, we have Hispanic populations that the higher they are, the less ideological extreme, right? The lower the Hispanic population, the more uh, extreme, right? And so, again, this just shows um, some preliminary evidence that suggests, right, that what we expect is true, that these districts that are really highly Latino or highly Hispanic will have generally less of extreme members. Um, and this just gives you kind of the estimate here, but if you compare Latino candidates, white candidates, black and Asian candidates, you can see the, um, the estimate of coefficient of all the way there is the only significant one. And what that means basically is that Latino candidates, Latino Republicans are much more likely to be ideologically extremely more conservative right, Republicans than their non-Latino counterparts. And so in addition to having a statistically significant relationship with ideological extremity, Latino legislators are the only ethnic group right, that appear to be a predictor of conservative ideological extremity. And this is even more pronounced when we look at um, female or women. Um, I don't know if I have that there, but I can show you that later. Um, Latina legislators are much more likely to be ideologically conservative than their non-Hispanic counterparts. And if you consider these results in combination with the recent surge in Latina Republican candidates, it's apparent that this candidate pool of Latina Republicans running is rapidly changing. And this is something that, that demands sort of uh, attention, right? Because it's just the past several years that this is happening, right? Where you see this rapid increase in the number of Latinos running. And so I want to conclude by just saying, and I, and I kind of wanted to say this at the outset, I use the term, you know, shifting allegiances um, because we think that there is this sort of shift. It's not this massive movement towards Republicans that some Republicans uh, hoped or, or want. Um, but there is the, there are these shifting allegiances that more and more Latinos are voting uh, for Republican candidates. And then likewise, more and more Latino Republicans are running for office, right? And the more that run, the more likelihood that you're going to have winners. Because one of the issues in South Texas is that there were never any Republicans even bothering to run, right, for these, uh, these state legislative seats because they were so solidly democratic. And so as more and more of these candidates start to run, even though the proportions will show that they're not winning quite yet, that's something that takes time, right? And so it's something I think that um, Democrats shouldn't sort of um, ignore, right? Because like any political party, their task is to win elections, right? And Republicans are sort of working these immigrant communities and trying to run candidates in these communities. And they're having some success, right? It's not this massive success that, um, that Republicans had hoped for, but it's something to pay attention to. But the story of Latino Republican legislators just being isolated to Cuban Americans and that there's like really nothing to talk about here because it's just a small group. It's just happening in Florida. You know, Latinos are just going to, they're, they're Democrats, right? They're about a third that are Republican, but they're mostly Cubans, but we have nothing to talk about. I think that's also misguided because, as I've shown you, right, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that this is not just a Cuban phenomenon. Right? This is people of all national origins as well. And also, to conclude, right, Latinos are increasingly moving to key battleground states, right, and making these shifts all the more meaningful, especially if you think, the con think of the context of national elections, right, and how Latinos vote not just for these local offices, right, but for presidential races as well. And I'll just say that there is this hyper-focus on the presidential race, which I think is important, right? But one of the things that we should pay attention to is that at the local and state level, this is where really all the action in American politics is happening at the state level, right? There's a lot of research that shows this, that in the absence of a functioning Congress, right? in the absence of a functioning federal government, which doesn't appear to show any signs of changing anytime soon, that states are really stepping up and filling in this policy vacuum on all kinds of issues, including immigration, which is a federal issue, right? And so it matters, right, who's in these state legislative seats. And so that's why it's important to think about the changing demographics 
of, of the United States, but also how those changing demographics are reflected in those institutions of state legislatures. And of course, Congress is important because it, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's something that they do have a role in the constitutional order, uh, even though they're not quite fulfilling it. Um, but nevertheless, that's something that we should pay attention to. And again, I just want to conclude by saying thank you for paying attention. I do have more slides, but I, I kind of say a really statistical <laughs> <laughs> for coffee and, <laughs> and alcohol. So thank you, and I look forward to any of your questions.